Good morning. Uh, Please turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 6 will be our text this morning. Uh, There's a phrase uh, that has been often said by many wise people. I don't know who first said it, but whoever said it first knew exactly what they were talking about. And that's the phrase that things are going to get worse before they get better. Uh, There are a lot of examples from life you could point to to illustrate that this is true. If you ever started a new workout, you know this is going to get worse before it's going to get better, right? I mean, this doesn't just happen by itself, right? I mean, you've got to maintain that. Uh, if you've ever started on a new diet, right, you know I'm going to feel worse before I feel better. Um, going back to school, it's going to start hard before it gets better. Any number of things get worse before they get better. One example, though, that is near and dear to my heart is the example of potty training children. Hey, anytime you start to potty train your children, inevitably you find yourself scrubbing the furniture, scrubbing the floors, scrubbing your children, uh, doing lots of extra laundry, or maybe in my case just saying, Rachel, we need to do more laundry, right? Uh, back in Texas, we had a cat, and when we first brought Luke home from the hospital, the cat started marking everything in our house. Uh, so we sent the cat to go live on a farm. Okay. That's not a metaphor. We actually sent our cat to go live on a farm. Uh, So later when Luke started doing the same thing, I asked Rachel if we could send Luke to go live on a farm. I still don't understand, but she says it's two different things. I'm not sure why. That's all right. Okay, and when you start potty training your kids, the first thing you realize is that diapers are easier than potty training. Okay, A, a practiced parent can change a diaper faster than a NASCAR pit crew can change a tire, right? This is easy. You just change the diaper, you throw it away, everything is great. And so there's a temptation when you start potty training, and when all you're doing is cleaning up messes, the temptation is to say, you know what, diapers were so much easier, let's just go back to that when life was easy, Right? And maybe if your kid's not getting it, you do that for a while. But eventually, you continue to persevere. You continue to go through with the potty training because you know there is a promised land coming. Right? The glory land is in the distance, and if we just keep push- persevering, eventually, we will get there. At some point in life, your son can successfully go to the bathroom, wash his hands every time, And do all of it without making a mess. Okay, I'm told from some of you that happens about the time they turn 15, that they get all of those steps, right? But eventually, there is a promised land coming. And every parent that starts potty training knows intuitively, right? We know this is going to get worse before it gets better. Right, when God announces that he's going to take the children of Israel out of Egypt, take them to the promised land, things are going to get worse before they get better. All right, and here's why that matters spiritually, why it matters so much to us. Okay, because when things get worse, what's our temptation? Well, our temptation is to retreat, right? It's to go back to when things were a little bit easier. Okay, for the Israelites, it was, well, wouldn't life be better if we just went back to Egypt? Okay, we go back to the way things used to be before things got so hard. Okay, for spiritual stuff with us, for instance, I know I shouldn't gossip. Okay, but if I'm really tempted, then it's much easier to just tell that story than it is to press on knowing that there is a better and gossip-free relationship if I just keep going and persevering, right? Okay, and we could apply that to any number of temptations or any number of sins in our lives. It seems so much harder to progress forward with God, and wouldn't it be much easier if I could just take a step back into what's comfortable And I can live in the brokenness that I know rather than to move forward with God knowing it's going to get harder before it gets easier. As we read this story about God's people coming out of Egypt, we see this same thing over and over again. We're trying to go to Canaan. We want to go to the promised land. But wouldn't it be much easier if we just go back to slavery in Egypt? All right, uh, the last couple weeks we spent looking at Exodus chapters 3 and 4. 
we noted the five objections that God receives from Moses, right? God calls Moses and he says in five different ways, God, I really wish you would send someone else. God finally overcomes all of those objections. Moses agrees. He says, okay, I'm going to go down to Egypt. First thing he does is he meets with the elders of Israel and he shows them the three signs God gave to him. He turns his staff into a snake. Um, He turns water to wine. He puts his hand in his cloak and it comes out leprous. He says, I really am coming to you from God. And then he meets with Aaron, his brother, who's going to speak for him, and everything is going great. Everybody believes God is about to redeem his people. This is going to be wonderful. Chapter 4 ends with everybody bowing down in worship to Yahweh. We are thankful that God and the salvation he is about to unleash have finally come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we turn the page, we get to chapter 5, and we're expecting great things. And it starts great. Okay, In chapter 5, Moses and Aaron, they go boldly into the court of Pharaoh himself, and they say to him, the Lord says, you should let my people go and go worship God in the desert. But then Pharaoh turns and he looks at Moses, and he says, no, I don't know this God. You say that some God named Yahweh has told you to go, but who is that? I don't know him. What do I care what he thinks? I'm God. And then Moses says, you really should listen. Okay, because if you don't, God will strike you down and bad things are going to happen. This is your one good chance to get out of this okay. But Pharaoh says no. In fact, he says, the problem is that you people are lazy. You have too much time on your hands, and so now you've come up with all of these visions of your own freedom, and if I give you more to do, maybe you won't have so much to complain about. Okay, so you've been making bricks for me, and I've been giving you the straw to make the bricks. Now, in order to keep you from being so lazy, I want you to make the same number of bricks for me each day, but now I'm not going to give you any straw. It may be giving you more work will keep you in line. All right, notice what Pharaoh says in chapter 5, verse 9. It says, make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. All right, now as you can imagine, the elders of Israel, all the people of Israel, they don't take this out on Pharaoh. They take it out on Moses. Why? Well, he's the one that had to go and poke the bear right? Just leave well enough alone. Moses, why have you brought this trouble down on us? We were better off before you filled our heads with these visions of freedom. Staying in Egypt is easier than moving forward with God. This is too hard. We can't do it, right? And Moses agrees. Okay, notice what Moses says at the very end of chapter 5, starting in verse 22. It says, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people. Okay, and I love this next line. This is my favorite thing in all of chapter 5. He says, and you have not rescued your people at all. I think my four-year-old whines less than Moses at this point, right? Okay, so now we turn the page. We get into chapter 6. God shows up, and he repeats his promises to Moses. He says, Moses, you need to keep going. This is not going to be a work of you. This is going to be my work. Things are hard, but they will get better. Right? And God gives Moses three very specific promises in order for, for Moses to remember the covenant and to remember that he can do this, but he's going to have to do it with God. You want to press on to the promised land. You want things to finally get better. They're going to be tough for a while, but you can do this. Let's keep pressing forward with God. And the way that we can keep pressing forward with God in spite of it getting worse is we will remember these promises that God makes. All right, so you've got space on your bulletin if you're taking notes. Uh, Here's promise number one. God promises us redemption. And notice verse six of chapter six. It says, therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. 
I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Okay, I'm not usually real big on word studies. I know a lot of people when they study scripture, they do a whole lot of word studies. I think sometimes that leads us to make connections that aren't really there. Uh, But one word that comes up over and over again as we read through the story of Exodus is the word service. Okay, the word service. But this tends to be obscured in our English Bibles uh, because there's so many different ways we have of translating the word service. Okay, um, we translate it as worship sometimes. We translate it as slavery sometimes. There's lots of different ways we can do this. Okay, but Pharaoh makes the Israelites serve with harsh service in chapter 1. Okay, in chapter 5, in the Bricks Without Straw episode, he makes them serve harder and keep serving. Okay, Pharaoh always refers to the Israelites as his servants. Okay, again, sometimes in English we talk about slaves or labors. Okay, but in Hebrew, these are all very tightly related words. They're all coming from the same root word, service. Okay, notice Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. It says, Then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Right, just about every English Bible translates that word in verse 23 as worship, right? Let them go out into the wilderness so that they can worship me. Okay, but again, it's coming from that same word, serve. Okay, God says, let them go out into the wilderness so that they can do service for me. Right, in chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, over and over again, it tells us it's about serving God instead of serving Pharaoh. Okay, we keep coming back to that word. The point is we can either serve Pharaoh in Egypt or we can leave and serve God in worship. Okay, so what does all this mean and, and why do we care so much about it? Right, well, when we think of this story, when we think about the concept of God's redemption, okay, whether we're talking about the redemption of the Israelites from Egypt or we're talking about the redemption that you and I have in Christ, okay, it is not emancipation, okay, it's repatriation. Does that make sense? It's not emancipation, it's repatriation. And what I mean by this is you and I are going to serve. Okay, throughout the Egypt episode, throughout all of the book of Exodus, it is assumed you and I, all of the people, are going to serve. The question is, are we going to serve Pharaoh or are we going to serve the Lord God? Okay, a long time after this, uh, Jesus will talk about how you can't serve both God and money, right? Okay, it's the same idea. You and I are going to serve something. You're going to live for something. By God redeeming us, he's not redeeming us so that we can just go do whatever we want. He's redeeming us so that we can serve him. Does that all make sense? All right, I, I read an interesting article this week uh, about adolescence in men. And it was talking about the stages of maturity from being a boy to becoming a mature man. All right, and the premise of this article, uh, which I'm sure most of the wives in here would agree with, is that a lot of men never mature much past adolescence. I thought that would get me a few amens, but that's all right. Uh, And the reasoning for this, according to the experts, is because we don't understand real freedom. Okay, in our culture today, we've never really understood what freedom is all about. What we tend to think of freedom is we think freedom means I can do what I want. Freedom means I can make my own choices, I can make my own destiny, and for most of our young men, they are growing up with this idea that whenever I get to become an adult, then I get to make decisions for myself. I get to be the one who decides stuff, no more will my parents tell me what to do, I can make my own choices. Okay, and a lot of men get stuck just past adolescence because we keep chasing this idea that what freedom is, is that I get to do what I want to do. And we don't understand that what true freedom is, is choosing the right master. 
Okay? And real maturity comes when we choose to put other people first, put our families first, put the, the providing that we're supposed to do first, and do all of those right things. Okay? This article I was reading is not written from a Christian perspective at all, but I think it understood the point quite clearly that real freedom is not, oh, now I get to do whatever I want to do. Real freedom is saying, I'm going to serve something. Let me make sure that I serve the right master. Okay, I'm sure there's a correlation there for women too, uh, but I'm smart enough not to talk about it. Right? I think a lot of people spend their lives trying to get free from something, never realizing that the only way to be free of whatever sin it is, whatever power it is of this world that is enslaving them, is instead to become a servant of God. You know, Moses will later talk about serving God by making animal offerings. Uh, he'll talk about serving God when we go and partake of the Passover together as the people of God. In fact, the majority of the book of Exodus is not spent on the story of how we got out of Egypt. The majority of the book of Exodus is spent on how we will set up a tent in the desert so that we may serve God properly. Okay, that's the biggest part of the story. Right, so a lot of times in church we talk about worship and in culture a lot they're talking about you know the worship wars we're going to do contemporary or old stuff or what are we going to do and we have a lot of discussions revolving around worship in our churches okay and there's a whole lot we could say about all that but it starts with this idea whatever we're doing it's got to be about serving god and okay, that's the foundation Right? What songs we sing, everything else we do, that all has to come back to that at some point. What we are about as the people of God is that we are serving God. Fair enough? All right, that's promise number one. Uh, promise number two is the promise of adoption. Okay, notice what he says in the next verse, verse 7 of chapter 6. God says, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. All right, I've got to show you a one-minute video uh, because this was a totally new concept to me. I was just introduced to this this week. Um, and this is not just one of those things you saw on the internet, right? This I actually went and verified. This is really true. Lots of documented cases of this exact phenomenon that I'm about to show you. Go ahead. Raised by goats. Anyone who has ever been up in the mountains knows that they can be a dangerous place. From the treacherous landscape to the wild animals to the harsh conditions, unless you know what you're doing, we wouldn't suggest heading up there on your own. Then there's the story of a boy known only as Daniel. Allegedly abandoned by his family as a small child, Daniel is said to have lived and been raised by goats in the Andes Mountains of Peru. Discovered by other humans in 1990, Daniel survived by drinking goat's milk and eating the roots and berries which his four-legged companions consumed. Over the eight years that he lived with the goats, Daniel naturally began to copy their movements and even walked on all fours. Unsurprisingly, he couldn't speak any language, but had developed the ability to communicate with his family of goats. We can only imagine the thoughts of the hikers who stumbled across the then 12-year-old Daniel as he raced around the rocky ledges with his pack of wild goats. Reportedly, a group of researchers from an American university were able to study the Andes goat boy, and they are the ones who decided to name him Daniel. Isn't that fascinating? Okay, he could speak goat. All right, it's incredible. All right, this is one of dozens of cases that we have documented throughout history uh, of what's known as feral children. Okay, children who have been raised by wild animals. This isn't something that Disney created, right? This is a real phenomenon that happens. There are documented cases of children being raised by wolves, being raised by dogs, being raised by chickens and apes and monkeys, even ostriches. There's a boy in Africa raised by a tribe of gazelle. Okay, there's pigs, and even there's a case of a kid who was raised by cats. Okay. He looked down on all the other feral children, by the way, so cat. All right. And we laugh, okay, but all of these cases are incredibly sad. Right? And, and they have a really hard time when they do pull these kids out of this environment, integrating them back into normal human society, uh, because the children take on all of the characteristics of the animals who are raising them. Okay? Many times if there's cases of kids who can run on all fours, 
faster than other kids their age can run on two legs. In the cases of the kids that were raised by monkeys, they could climb trees better than you would ever think possible. Right? Their bodies changed to be more like the animals they lived around. Okay, one case in Belgium, I even had a boy who was raised by wolves who had a heightened sense of smell, and he could smell stuff nobody else that was human could smell. They became like what raised them. Okay, you see where I'm going with this? You inevitably take on the characteristics of who or even what raises you. Right, to one degree or another, all of us are products of our own environments. Right, and unless we have some very intentional or violent reaction against the way our parents raised us, we tend to become just like mom and dad, right? All of us can look at ourselves and see ways in which we act just like our parents. It is inevitable you will become like your parents. Okay, notice again what God says in 4.22. He says to Moses, he says, then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Okay, here's the point, and here's the promise that God then will make in chapter 6. He says, I am adopting you. Okay, I will be your father. Right, we as his people are raised by God as our parent. Okay, so, what does that mean about how we talk? Okay, what does that mean about how we walk around? About how we carry ourselves? Okay, what does that mean for how we then will treat other people? Okay, by having God take us on as his children, a huge part of what we're doing in this entire book is God is saying, I want you to be more like me. I'm taking you to be my children so that as you grow up, as you mature, you become more like God. God has adopted us. All right, also important in this concept is remembering uh, that behavior change follows inclusion. In other words, you don't change your behavior so that you can then become part of the family of God. What happens is God makes us part of his family, and then over time our behavior changes to more perfectly reflect God Almighty. Right? So it's not, oh, well, I better get my life right so that I can become one of these Christian Jesus followers. It's I'm going to become one of these Jesus followers so that I can become more like this Jesus guy. Right? Inclusion is followed by our behavior change. Okay, one more piece of this, then we'll get to the last promise. Uh, but according to this story, Israel is God's one and only son. Okay, which is a phrase that should immediately resonate with all of us who have ever read the Gospels. All right, and this is beyond the scope of our text this morning, uh, but the ministry of Jesus is all about Jesus fulfilling this role of being this perfect Israelite, being this representative of God's people who could perfectly reflect the glory of God our Father. Okay, the promise is you and I have been adopted by God. All right, number three and finally, uh, it's a promise of home. Okay, notice verse eight. God says, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Uh, we didn't plan this out at all, uh, but this morning Randy led about three songs that we listened to a whole lot when we were in the hospital for so long with Luke. A couple times Rachel started tearing up saying this is just taking me back to when we were in the hospital every day. Okay, We have spent a lot of nights in the hospital. Um, never once in all those nights we spent in the hospital did I get a good night's sleep in one of those stupid recliners. Okay? Any of you ever slept in a hospital before? Anyone ever gotten a good night's sleep in a hospital before? Yeah. Okay. I want you to imagine, though, if instead of the stupid recliner they make you sleep in, imagine they brought you in a full king-size bed, right, with your own pillows in it and very nice sheets, really high thread count. Okay, imagine they started playing some really nice classical music on the stereo system, all right, and they turned down the lights just right. They maybe lit some candles for you. Uh, and maybe they brought in a gourmet chef to cook you some really nice meals while you were staying there in the hospital. Okay, would it feel like home? No. First off, because my home doesn't look like that. But 
Okay, I don't care how nice they made it, that hospital would never feel right because it's not home. It's not where I'm supposed to be. It's somewhere else. It's somewhere on the journey. It's not home. Okay, our final promise of our text this morning is that if we will stick with God, then even when things get worse, eventually God will take us home. All right, at this time in our service, we're going to sing some verses of an invitation song. Uh, During the singing of this song, I will be down front. One of our shepherds will be down front. This is an opportunity for you uh, to come and share with us whatever's going on in your life. Let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. Let us study God's word with you. Talk more about what it means to follow this God who does promise to take us home. This song is a time for us as the church to be here for you. Uh, Let's close, though, with a word of blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. Let's stand and sing.